So we're going to start out with a chain rule with w as the output of the function f. And we're going to let uh, x be a function of t. y is going to also be a function of t, where alpha of t is going to be x of t, y of t. <clears throat> now we're going to take alpha and f it. The reason we're allowed to do this is because alpha outputs two dimensions and f inputs two dimensions. So if you think about the way this function works right here, we have alpha goes from r1 to r2, and then this function f takes two uh, dimensions and then outputs, well I didn't really write what it outputs, but the functions we're using output one dimension. So we're inputting one dimension, turning it into two dimensions, and then back out to one dimension. So what this means, f of alpha go from r1 to r1. So this composition has a regular derivative. What variable does it make sense to take the derivative of the f of alpha function? T. So t is the only derivative, or the only input variable. So that means when we take this derivative, it's not partial. There's only one input variable. So it's just d dt. It's not a partial derivative. So we're about to take the t derivative of f of alpha of t. So we're going to look at what this is going to look like. Let's do something really bad with this pink marker. And then we'll talk about why this doesn't make any sense. All right, so a few things we're doing here. If I write f prime, what? Do I mean by derivative? Remember the function f has two inputs. So right away f prime doesn't make sense. Do I mean fx or fy derivative? So that's one issue. The other problem is f outputs numbers, alpha outputs vectors. So what you're looking at, if f prime actually existed, you'd be multiplying a number by a vector. So maybe that's a good idea, maybe not. So, the way this works is there's really two derivatives you can take of f, and there's two components to the alpha function. So, the way the derivative actually works, so this doesn't really make sense. That's just naively applying the chain rule that we're thinking about. The actual chain rule work, yes, we do take the derivative of f, but we're going to first take the x derivative. Now, you're going to input just alpha t, like you would expect. So this acts like f prime. Now when I write alpha prime, what we're really going to be doing is taking the, x deriv uh, the t derivative of the x function. So that'll be dx over dt. Plus, we're now going to take the y derivative of the f function, still plugging in alpha of t, times dy over dt. And you can write this as df dx times dx dt. And yes, the df dx is partial, because there's two inputs to the f function.
So I'm going to factor this using a dot product. Now, if you take the dot product, you're multiplying the first two together, and then you add when you multiply the second two together. That's how dot products work. So we multiply df dx by dx dt. So multiply the first two together, and then add, multiply the second two together. So if you take this dot product, you get the line above. You just multiply the first two, second two, add them together. All right, the second part right here, I can rewrite it as ddt of just the x of t, y of t function, or this is ddt alpha of t. That's all we're looking at on the right side there. Now on the left side, I'll write it with the fx comma fy notation like this. There is a special name for take the x partial, the y partial, and put them together. We call this the gradient. It's an upside down delta next to f right there. It says basically take all the partial derivatives and line it up like it's a vector. So take the first variable partial derivative, comma, second variable partial derivative, comma, third variable if you have it. So this is one formula for the derivative that we just computed up there. Uh, if you want to see a different way of diagramming this out, that's more like, uh, it's gonna look a lot more like this right here. So let's look at our inputs. I'll have this function input at the bottom So basically you're taking your t input and t gets turned in by alpha into an x and a y and then f takes the x and y values and turns them back into a single output. So you can think about the function mean diagram like this right here and then when you take your derivatives you have alpha x fx alpha y fy right there. So you're sort of taking the derivatives going along here. So a few different ways to think about it. So delta f's the gradient. If f goes from r n into r, and gradient f will be fx1 comma fx2 fxn. So the gradient is going to have n dimensions to it, just like the input to the function f. So let's go ahead and compute an example here. So W is going to be x, y plus z along the path alpha of t. So how many dimensions does alpha have to output? Alpha needs to output three dimensions here. So this particular path will go with cos t comma sine t comma t. So this w, this is f of x, y, z right there. So there's two things we need to compute, the gradient of f, so all the partial derivatives of f, and then also the derivative of alpha. 
So let's go with gradient f first. So this is going to be fx comma fy comma fz. And then also compute alpha prime of t. So compute these two right now and then take their dot product. So we're taking the t derivative, which will be gradient f dot alpha prime. <coughs> So your gradient f should be x comma or y comma x comma one. So any questions on that that derivative? Your alpha prime, we did lots of these computations before. This is just the velocity of your path right here. That's just negative sign, positive cosine one. So we did that computation lots of times. Alright, I think there's one thing I forgot to be careful about. So let's scroll back up for a minute. So I took the x derivative of f, but I forgot to input not x, y, but alpha of t. So I got a little bit lazy here. So both df dx and df dy need to input t, not input x and y. So I'm going to rewrite these. We have to input alpha of t here. Alright, so it's going to be gradient of f of alpha of t. So that is important. So it's not just a gradient of f, but it's a gradient of f where you plug in alpha of t. So this may seem confusing. Let's carefully go through. We did compute the gradient of f. Now what I'm going to com compute is gradient f of alpha of t. So <clears throat> wherever you see y, you're going to plug in the y, the alpha path that uses y. So y is sine of t, x is cosine of t. So instead of just y right here, I'm using sine of t. Where I see x, that's cosine of t, and then 1 is just 1. So it's super important. It's not just a gradient of f, but it's a gradient of f composed with the alpha function. So you have gradient f of alpha t, so that's sine t cos t1, dot negative sine t 
Boost T, comma, one. So our derivative is negative sine squared t plus cos squared t plus 1. You could do a little trick to turn this into just sine squares or just cos squareds, but because it's not sine squared plus cos squared, they're not going to just cancel out completely. So we'll do one, well, we'll do two more examples total. So hopefully this will make a little more sense our second time around. But the tricky part is the gradient's usually not hard to compute, but remembering to plug back in your function of t can be tricky. So we'll do some more examples that are similar to this.